Please take your copy of the scriptures and turn to Daniel chapter 6. In Daniel chapter 6. We arrived this morning at Daniel chapter 6 and what is without a doubt one of the most famous stories in all the Bible. But friends, it is vitally important that that we understand this is far from a fanciful tale. In fact, I mentioned last week that I've been surprised over and over how clearly this ancient book speaks directly into our present world. Well, this has never been more true than it is in Daniel chapter 6. I want to follow the pattern that I did in chapters 2 and 3. I will walk through the details of the story outlined in chapter 6, and then my, my plan was to offer you six faith-fueling and timely applications pulled directly from this inspired text, but I realized last night that I needed to split this into two sermons. So I'm going to give you four today, and then at least two more next week. We'll see what happens over the course of the next six days. So let's begin in verse one. Look at the text with me. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give an account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. As chapter 6 begins, we meet a new king referred to as King Darius. Now, this is probably just another designation for King Cyrus. In fact, if you skip down to verse 28, A legitimate interpretation of this verse uh, could be, so this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, that is the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. As we've already seen with both Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, Daniel, now a man in his 80s, has gained favor with Darius as well, so much so that the text tells us he's a cut above everyone else. And the plan is for Daniel to assume a position of tremendous influence over all the kingdom. But Daniel's planned promotion isn't welcome news to everyone. Look at verse four. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. As the other recognized leaders put their heads together to conspire against Daniel, they became frustrated because they can't figure out any basis for an attack on him. He's a man of honesty and integrity and there's nothing more frustrating to vicious and deceitful people than those who have nothing to hide. Of course, these men will not be easily stopped. So look now at verse five. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast in the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document 
so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. Did you follow that? All the corrupt politicians agree on a sinister plan and they bring it to King Darius. First, they butter him up, they stroke his ego, and then they make their presentation. Now, not surprisingly, King Darius is all in. He thinks their plan is great because he thinks he's pretty great. In fact, now that he's had a chance to think about it, he really, he really does deserve to be worshiped. So he signs into law a prohibition against prayer. No one can pray to anyone other than him for the next 30 days. So what is Daniel's response to this? Is he overcome with fear and panic? Does he organize a protest against the unlawful declaration of the king? Does he compose a, a lengthy Facebook post about the corruption of the Babylonian government? Does he go into hiding? Does he make a deal with God to simply take a 30-day break from public prayer? Well, let's find out. Verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any God or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, the thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times times a day. Daniel, Daniel remains faithfully committed to prayer and the unashamed worship of God. And his opponents are delighted that their plan has worked. Daniel has been caught. King Darius is informed that someone has violated his decree and that the rule breaker is his beloved and trusted servant, Daniel. Verse 14, then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and the Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. What a picture of the depth of the envy and hatred these men have for Daniel. And yet we see the love and affection Darius has for Daniel. Strange picture. In the end, Darius can't, he can't be revealed to be weak. He can't figure out a way to walk back his own order. So Daniel must be punished. Verse 16. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. 
And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Daniel is cast into a lion-infested tomb. The tomb is sealed, and the king is immediately tormented by the, by the reality of what he's done and will, what will certainly happen. The man the king trusts most is going to die because the king was deceived into making a misguided and self-serving law by a group of jealous men. After a sleepless night, Verse 19, at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Like his three friends who emerged from the fiery furnace, and the text said back in chapter 3, verse 27, the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks, cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Look how Daniel is now described. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him. It's clear that what's happened is the undeniable work of God. How does Darius respond? Verse 24. The king commanded, those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. Before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Again, just in case you're tempted to dismiss the miracle God has performed by claiming that there must have been something wrong with the lions. Well, no, the text makes it clear that they're just fine. Totally normal, extraordinarily dangerous lions. Verse 25 reveals Darius's response. And it's almost identical to how Nebuchadnezzar responded after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego emerged from the fiery furnace. Look at verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the people's nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Verse 28, so this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Darius had just been with his own eyes, he had just seen with his own eyes a staggering example of his power compared to God's power. And he has to admit that he cannot do what only God can do. Just listen to verse 27 again. Speaking of the true God, Daniel's God, he delivers and rescues Darius couldn't do that. He works signs and wonders. Darius couldn't do that. In heaven and on earth, he who has saved Daniel, Darius couldn't do that, from the power of the lions. Now, friends, with this 
familiar story to many of you. With this story in mind, let me offer you four faith-fueling and timely applications that I believe are pulled directly from this inspired text. Faith-fueling application number one. God raises up his servants for his own glory. God raises up his servants for his own, that is, for God's own glory. As we consider all that's taken place in the first six chapters of Daniel, there are many lessons we can learn from Daniel. But as I've said so many times already, Daniel is not the hero of this story. Without diminishing the faithfulness of Daniel, this story does not primarily display the greatness of Daniel. In fact, take your copy of the scriptures and turn back to chapter 1. I want you to see this in the text. Chapter 1, look at verse 9. This is from the very beginning. What does verse 9 say? Where did Daniel's favor come from? God gave Daniel favor. Skip down to verse 17. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill. Now go to chapter 2. When Daniel stands before Nebuchadnezzar and offers him the interpretation of his dream, what does he say? Verse 28. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. In chapter 3, when Daniel's three friends walk out of the fiery furnace unharmed, Nebuchadnezzar admits that it was God who delivered his servants. Look at verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants. In chapter 4, it is God who reveals another dream to Daniel and strengthens him to deliver the message of God's impending judgment to Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 5, God again gives Daniel the wisdom and strength to understand the mysterious writing on the wall and then emboldens Daniel to deliver a message of judgment to Belshazzar. Now, how does chapter 6 begin? Daniel is being placed by God into a position of great influence and responsibility. Why was this happening to Daniel? What set him apart? The text tells us, verse 3, that an excellent spirit was in him. And verse 4, he was faithful and trustworthy. Friends, I want you to hear what one commentator clarifies for us. Daniel's rise in power is not to be attributed so much, if at all, to his natural ability or exceptional giftedness. It is to be attributed to his walk with God and the work God had done in his life. Daniel was a James 3.17 man who possessed spiritual wisdom that comes from above. You see, Daniel didn't set out to be influential and powerful. He was taken from his homeland. He was placed into the service of a pagan king, all according to God's sovereign plan. But listen, as he walked faithfully, as Daniel walked faithfully through life as a worshiper of God, God continued to sovereignly place Daniel in situations where he would have a unique opportunity to display God's glory in profound ways. Brothers and sisters, worship God faithfully and walk through life in humble obedience to him. Make much of him. God may or may not place you in a position of great influence. That's entirely up to him. 
but your chief concern is to enjoy God, to delight in God, to worship God wherever he places you and whatever he calls you to do. Glorify and enjoy God in your sovereign placement as a teacher or a stay-at-home mom or a business owner or a mechanic or a lawyer or a medical professional or a student or in your retirement. Seek first the kingdom of God and then see what your king wants to do with you. But whatever it is, Your primary goal, your primary goal will be to glorify and magnify the majesty of God in every situation of life to push attention to him. This brings us to application number two. Faith fueling application number two. Earthly power. You've heard this before. Earthly power and earthly leaders are ultimately a mirage. Earthly power and earthly leaders are ultimately a mirage. Now we've seen this already in both Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, but it happens again with Darius, doesn't it? Against the backdrop of God's infinite might, we encounter a king that can be buttered up and manipulated by a self-serving, smooth-talking band of scoundrels. Friends, this scene in Daniel chapter six, this scene feels like it's plucked from a thousand different political headlines in just the last few months at every level of government. Look at verse six again, and picture this. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement, backroom deal, to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, they shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. You can almost picture this, can't you? Darius is listening to this. He's thinking, this is a great idea. Yes. Show me where to sign. Right? This is gross. They don't mean anything they're saying. They're simply heaping flattery on Darius, and it works. Brothers and sisters, I can think a few things. I can think a few things that ought to strengthen your faith at this very moment than to remember that God cannot be manipulated. And he cannot be influenced by flattery. You can't coerce God or convince him to act like a divine puppet. No, God is absolutely sovereign. He's perfect in holiness. He is infinitely loving. He's eternally righteous. Everything he does is right. Everything he does is good. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that my hope is in God, not in any earthly ruler 
or elected official. It's not, so don't, don't misunderstand me, it's not that I don't care what's happening in the world. I do. But there is something exceedingly comforting about singing these words and actually believing they're true. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This brings us to application number three, faith fueling application number three. Faithful Christianity will always face worldly opposition. Faithful Christianity will always face worldly opposition. Danny Aiken, in his commentary on Daniel, reminds us that, quote, the blessings of the righteous can stir up the jealousy of the wicked. The blessings of the righteous can stir up the jealousy of the wicked. This is what happened to Daniel. Right? Here you have someone who should have been an outsider. A man that should have always been a servant. And yet he's being elevated to a place of prominence. And it makes a group of insecure men very angry. So they conspire against Daniel. Now friends, I want you to hear this. This is... <clears throat> a necessary reminder for all of us. Persecution and suffering. Persecution and suffering is an unavoidable part of life for believers. This has always been true, and it will always be true. It was true for Daniel, it was true for Jesus, and it is true for you. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus says, In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Paul reminds us in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Walking in joyful obedience to God and faithfully worshiping him will at some point and in some way bring suffering and persecution into your life. And yet, and yet, You will never, Christian friend, you will never face anything that causes God to abandon you. The certainty of suffering, persecution, and seemingly never-ending trials can, can hang like a, a black drape over our lives, making everything seem dark and depressing. But you see, it's against this darkness that the sparkling majesty of a promise like Hebrews 13, 5 shines in glorious splendor. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Jason Harrison unwrapped this great text for us through both a blog post and a sermon a few months ago. In his blog post, he directed our attention to Charles Spurgeon's explanation of Hebrews 13, 5, what he called an all-in-one promise. An all-in-one promise. Spurgeon said, to put everything in one, there is nothing you can want, there is nothing you can ask for, there is nothing you can need in time or in eternity. There is nothing living, nothing dying. There is nothing in this world, nothing in the next world. There is nothing now, nothing at the resurrection morning, nothing in heaven that is not contained in this text. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. 
Now, don't you think, don't you think this sort of assurance, the assurance of God's unfailing covenant love was ringing in Daniel's ears as everyone stood against him? I do. I don't know what else sustains a Christian when they feel all alone and the world doesn't make any sense. Friends, cling. Cling to this promise. This leads us to the final point we'll cover this morning. Faith fueling application number four. You'll see the last one leads into this one. Persecuted and or ostracized believers don't need to panic. Persecuted and or ostracized believers don't need to panic. Brothers and sisters, no matter what is happening in this world, if every freedom we now enjoy is taken away from us, if injustice of every kind becomes rampant, if the United States of America as we know it ceases to exist, if biblical Christianity itself is outlawed, we would have no reason to panic. Now again, don't misunderstand me. I don't want any of those things to happen. But didn't I just describe the world Daniel lived in? And yet this astonishing story reminds us that in the midst of Horrific injustice and unimaginable evil living under the rule of utterly wicked men. It is possible. It is possible to live a prayerful, obedient, worshipful, content life. How? How? Well, there are a few different ways to answer that question. But nothing, let me start here. Nothing, nothing Daniel experienced changed this reality. God is sovereign and has power over every square inch of the entire universe. Nothing that Daniel experienced, nothing that anybody in this room has or will experience changes that reality. In fact, in closing, consider again Daniel's hymn of praise in chapter two and then the unexpected eruptions of praise offered by Nebuchadnezzar and Darius. Flip back to chapter two. Daniel chapter 2, look with me at verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we ask of you For you have made known to us the king's matter. Now go to chapter 4 and look at verse 34. 
Daniel 4, verse 34, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now go to chapter 6, our text this morning, and look again at verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. Enduring forever, his kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. <clears throat> so, if wisdom and might belong to God, and he changes times and seasons, and he removes kings and sets up kings, and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation, and he is the living God, and his kingdom shall never be destroyed, and he delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on the earth, and he saved Daniel from the power of the lions, if all of this is right, as well as 10 million more mind-boggling truths about God, then what reason do we ever have to panic? Especially this side of the cross. Brothers and sisters, so much so much of what, what I want you to walk away with this morning is summarized in the song that we will sing in just a moment. He will hold me fast. If that's true, and we believe it is, then that should bring a calm over you. It should change your perspective. You should look at everything differently. But here's one warning. Don't, I find myself doing this sometimes, don't sing this song or listen to the song as a song of resignation. All right? Well, at least he'll hold me fast. No, this is a song of celebration. Amidst all the chaos, all the confusion of this world, you are being held fast by God in Jesus Christ who delights in you. Again, friends, there's, there's nothing that reorients our thinking like this glorious, truth. Let's pray together.